Hey, good morning. I'm very happy um, to be given the opportunity to be here today, or at least be here virtually, to present um, the KU Leuven and some of its latest research activities um, in the field of fiber, fiber acoustics. Um, the presentation of today uh, will be structured as follows. So first, I will take a couple of minutes to introduce um, who we are for the people that don't know our, our university yet. And then I will go into detail of, on two things that we have been doing in the past year. Uh, one is about fiber acoustic metal materials, and the second section is about bushing modeling and characterization. But so first, um, the KU Leuven. So here on the right hand side, you see some of the logos that you might have seen in the past. So now we are standard, standardized on this last logo. Um, so we're the University of Leuven, and Leuven stands for the city um, that we are from. Um, so Leuven is a city in Belgium, quite close to Brussels. Uh, for the people that don't know Europe that well, so Belgium is located in Western Europe. Uh, with us neighbors, France, Germany, um, the Netherlands, and over the sea, the UK. Um, so you can also see some numbers here on the right hand, on the left hand side. Um, so we founded in 1425, so we are quite old university, and we have about 60,000 students. So we're also a large university, and we're also the, the largest university in Belgium. Um, and the other numbers, I will not go into details, uh, but something that we take some pride in that is that we are, um, at least according to the ranking of Reuters, uh, we are the most innovative university in Europe. So that's uh, when you account for things as patents um, and bilateral research and those kind of things. Um, and that's now yeah, for the last years that we take the number one spot. Um, so that about the university. Um, to then go one step further, um, if you look at the research division itself, so we are part of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Leuven. And within, within that department, um, we are the Mechatronic System Dynamics um, Division, so in short, LMSD. And we are a division with about uh, nine academic staff members, so nine professors. We have two research managers, of which I am one, um, about 14 postdoctoral researchers and over 80 PhD students, um, of which 20 are industrial PhDs, so that means that those PhD students uh, spend quite some time over their PhD at, at, um, at industry site. Um, if you then go further, if you look at with the research areas that we span, so it's uh, fiber acoustics and air acoustics and multi-body dynamics. And those topics I will cover to some extent today. And besides that, we also do smart system dynamics and structural reliability and uncertainty. And that we then do for application domains re ranging from energy and environment, transport and mobility, health and advanced manufacturing. The examples that I will show today are mainly um, in the area of um, transport and mobility. And then as a research division, we're also part of uh, the Institute for Smart Manufacturing in Flanders. So Flanders is a region in Belgium called Flanders Make. Um, so that a bit about yeah, who we are and what size we have. Maybe a as a last slide on who we are. Um, yeah, it's, it's a strategy that we follow. So if you ask me to, to summarize activities of LMSD in one sentence, well, then it's our mission statement. Our mission statement is about and that you try to create added value in every phase in the lifetime of mechatronic systems. So if we say every phase, we're talking about either the design, the manufacturing, or operations, or the three of them. And we want to create that added value by understanding and controlling their dynamic behavior. So that can be the general motion that a product has to describe, but that also um, spans vibrations and acoustics, uh, for which we are here today, of course. And then in this, this um, when we try to achieve that goal, Typically, we try to incorporate uh, concepts such as model-based system engineering and digital twins. So that a bit on, on who we are. Um, if we then dive into the contents, then the first um, section that I would like to discuss with you is fiber acoustic metal materials. So fiber acoustic metal materials, um, we have discussed this as well in previous editions, um, but there the objective is to design material systems or material structures with good noise and vibration insulation properties. And then typically we aim for the four lows, as we say. So low mass, low volume, low frequency, and low manufacturing cost. And the way that we are trying to do that here in Leuven um, is by exploiting the concept of resonant um, metal materials. And with these resonant metal materials, I'm not going into details of the concept, but basically you try to embed some kind of resonant inclusions or resonant additions to your structure. And at the resonance frequency of those resonance um, structures, you can create so-called stop-end behavior, which means that the structure um, will be not receptive for vibrational energy and it will not radiate a lot of noise. So we can create tailored frequency regions with very good um, fiber acoustic properties. 
And in the past editions here at, um, at the workshop, I think we discussed um, the top example, which is um, a thermoform twin sheet panel where all these little cells are resonant structures. Um, and this is a kind of structure which can be used in combined harvesters. And I think we also discussed um, this example, which is a patch, a 3D printed patch, um, which we designed to replace the tuned vibration absorbers, which are now typically installed in a Range Rover Evoque um, to improve the fiberacoustic um, characteristics of the vehicle. So we removed the TVA and replaced it by these metal material patches. And we were able um, to get even better um, acoustic response within the vehicle while we um, only used half of the weight of the TVAs. So that shows a bit that it has some potential. Um, and today we will discuss a new thing that we're looking at, and, and that's more in the field of, um, of um, flow-induced vibrations and radiated noise. Um, so the, the problems that we're looking at are, are two problems. One is if you have a flow over a panel, then due to yeah, your, your turbulent boundary layer excitation, you will have vibrations in a plate and that can radiate noise. But it can also be that you have some kind of object in your flow, for example, a bluff object, which induces some vortex shedding and then um, in turn you will have some pressure fluctuations which also can induce vibrations in your plate and radiate noise. And the question is, can we use the metamaterial principle, so add some kind of resonant structures to have less noise radiation in these kind of structures? And the, here are the examples or the applications that we have in mind. I think that they are relatively obvious. Um, it then ranges from, from airplanes, um, but also, for example, um, high-speed trains, let's say, and those kind of things. So everywhere where you have yeah, this vortex shedding, problem or where you have, yeah, have turbulent boundary layer excitation. But for this presentation, we keep it on a conceptual and, and a lab, um, a conceptual design and a lab validation. Um, so what we will do is we have um, in-house a flow rig. Um, so where we have a roots blower, which can induce flow in this test section, so in the duct. And on that duct, we can install a plate. Um, and then we can measure the vibrations on top of the plate, or we can um, we can put a cavity on top of the plate and measure the pressure inside the cavity or, or on the edges to see how much noise is being um, radiated into that cavity. And then in the duct section, we can also insert a bluff object. Um, so this setup allows us to do an evaluation if you have some kind of issues with turbulent boundary layer excitation or with vortex shedding, um, you have to see how much radiation, how much vibrations are induced or how much noise is radiated. Um, so the setup in reality, it looks like this. So this test section is about five meters to give you some indication of the size. So it's a relatively small test panel. This is an aluminum panel um, in which we can either put the laser vibrometer on top um, or we can put or we can, can put our vibroacoustic cavity on top of our acoustic cavity and then do the evaluation at the microphone positions. And then the flow is coming from the top um, to the bottom. Um, so this text, test section, it's about um, it's about 15 centimeters on 7.5 centimeters. So it's a relatively um, narrow um, duct flow. It's confined flow, as you can see, and the mag number is about 0 0.05 during our testing. And then to introduce to introduce the vortex shedding, we just um, insert this cylinder in the duct section. Um, and then if you look a bit at the numbers of the flow that we use, uh, the diameter of the um, of the cylinder. Then we know that we expect some kind of vortex shedding going on at a frequency of around 600, 630 hertz. So if we take this test setup and we first look at the vibration spectrum, so the, if we scan with the laser vibrometer and we do an RMS average of the plate vibrations for each frequency, then we measure this kind of spectrum um, in the case that there is no bluff object in the flow yet, so it's just turbulent boundary layer excitation. And then based on this, we selected here a target frequency around 750 hertz um, to design our metal material solution. And we took this target because we know that this, um, this structural mode of our plate will induce acoustic modes in the cavity that we'll put on later on. Um, so we use the concept of metal materials. I will not go into the design rules, but basically if you, if you add resonant structures, so in this case, we chose this kind of plexiglass structure, which we can connect with its foot on a plate and then here, you have kind of a cantilever beam and a mass, so it will have a vibration mode, which in this case is around um, yeah, between 700 and 800 hertz. If you then add them in a periodic arrangement on your test panel, and then we know that we can induce stop end behavior and to evaluate the stop end behavior, we just have to model one unit cell of this plate, and then we get this kind of dispersion diagrams in which we can see how the bending waves, uh, which are here depicted in red, um, yeah, 
at which frequencies we will have bending wave in certain directions. And then we can see that certain frequency zones can open up in which we don't see bending waves. And um, it's a lot of details. And, and if you would like to have some information about how we actually do this, this design, I would take the questions later or, or we can discuss it um, offline. But basically we have these cheap tools to evaluate whether we expect something or not. And to benchmark our solution, we also make a design which is not resonant. So here it's a foot with just a mass on top, but that in, it's just to do a comparison that we add the same kind of mass to the structure and we have the same stiffness effect because we have the same foot. And here we don't expect stop and behavior. And if you do an evaluation, we evaluate basically three cases. The case um, where we cover the entire plate with our resonant masses, the case where we have the equivalent mass that we add, and then the case where we only add half of the resonant masses within a shackled pattern. And the way, the reason why we do that um, will become clear uh, later in this presentation. So let's look at the results. If we do this design, we expect stop end behavior in the frequency region indicated by the two black lines. And if we then look at the results for the vibration levels, um, if you treat the entire plate, then you can see that we indeed have this zone of um, reduced vibration attenuation, and that overall we create this frequency zone where you have less vibrations. If you then benchmark this with the case where we add equivalent masses, here shown in the purple dotted lines, then you see that in that case, um, you don't have this zone of reduced vibrations. Um, so hence you can clearly see that with this metamaterial concept, um, yeah, you have this beneficial effect which you would not have if you just add mass. And then if you compare this with the case that we have the shackled pattern, then you see that you still have some kind of vibration reduction, but you have less vibration reduction because you added less mass. Um, but you added the same resonant, um, yeah, you added the same resonant additions, so the effect is in the same frequency region. And that's typical for this metal material design. The more resonant mass you add, the more um, the more pronounced the effect will be. Um, so that, yeah, that's a bit the takeaway uh, which you can generalize. So that's for the vibrations. So let's look. Um, so let's look at um, what happens if you look at, at acoustic radiation. Um, and so here, the evaluation for our plate, um, uh, for the pressure inside of the cavity if we put it on top. And if you look at the response of the bare structure, it looked like the blue curve. And if you then look at our response um, for the entire plate um, treated with the metal material, um, you see that we have, in general, a good reduction and that this acoustic mode of the cavity is quite well um, attenuated. So if we zoom in, we see that we have a reduction of around 60 decibels um, for the sound pressure level inside of the cavity. So you see that this works quite well for the turbulent boundary layer excitation. So let's then continue uh, with the problem of vortex shedding. So if you look first again at the velocity response for the case of vortex shedding, if you then look at just um, the grazing flow, so without any, any cylinder inserted, that's a blue curve, and we could we we um, compare that to the case where there is a cylinder and hence you have vortex shedding. And um, then you see that you have this peak here. So basically it's a mode which was so well, not well excited before, but now due to the vortex shedding, um, the mode is excited very well. Um, and it's around yeah, 600 Hertz. So it was a frequency region that we theoretically expected to see something. Um, so you see that the vortex shedding, it's, yeah, makes a, no, a mode being excited well and leads to, to strong, um, strong vibrations basically. So that's the mode that we're going to try to tackle. If you look at the acoustic response, um, you actually see that not too much happens. It's a bit of pity, but we're, yeah, we're in a region where we didn't have too much pronounced um, effect of acoustic modes um, of the acoustic radiation. Um, but anyhow, you see that the vortex shedding induces um, some additional noise. Um, so we can see still whether the metal material will help to reduce the vibrations and to reduce that noise. Um, here again, we followed the same strategy. We again designed this resonator to be effective in the frequency region where we want it to be effective. So we expect this um, stop band around the 600 Hertz um, peak. And we again designed an equivalent mass um, so that we can benchmark our solution. And if we then have a look um, at how the metal material and the equivalent mass um, work, then if I look at the three curves, so this was a bare curve shown in green, the equivalent mass well, it shifts a bit um, the structural modes. So you see that that very pronounced structural mode that we had in our panel, it's a bit, it's a bit less excited because your mode is shifted, but you still see um, some response in your panel. While with the metal material solution, you see that you have a very strong reduction um, of your vibrations again. So that's a bit the takeaway of these metal materials. If you know where you're going to have an issue 
um, because of um, aerodynamic excitation and you design this metal material solution, um, you can rest assured that your vibrations um, will disappear um, at that frequency region. Um, and if you then look inside of our cavity at um, the radiated noise, then we can look again. Um, so if you look at the three curves, you see in the purple dotted line that it matches quite well with the green line, um, so not too much effect, while the, um, the metal material, it leads to this zone of attenuation again. So again, um, yeah, the metal material can be used as some kind of um, yeah, method to be sure that um, yeah, you have no problems with vibrations or attenuations due to turbine boundary layer excitation or due to um, vortex shedding. And then as a last example um, in this, um, on this work, um, we take a, the, shatter, the shattered pattern of last time um, and we add then on the empty spaces our solution for the vortex shedding. So in this way, we can see whether we can combine both the solution for vortex shedding and the solution for the turbulent boundary layer excitation. We can again do an evaluation of the stop ends. Um, and this graph now looks a bit more complex, but you see again blank lines where we don't expect vibrational modes um, and hence stop end behavior. And if we then look at the results, so now shown in, in yellow or in orange, um, you see that we find two zones of reduction. And you see that if you compare to the solution of the metal material only tuned to the vortex shedding, that yeah, the effect is a bit less pronounced because you have less resonant mass again at that particular frequency, but you're able to combine both bands. And you see that yeah, you have a bit of reduction that spreads out to the band. So we actually have a very nice region of reduction um, due to this metal material solution. So overall, the vibration response um, yeah, is, a, is a lot less um, convenient, let's say. So that'll be as um, takeaways for the metal material. So in conclusion, we add these resonant, um, resonant additions, so they can be incorporated in different ways. They can be added to your design, um, so it can be 3D printed with resonant additions. It can be thermoformed. It can be additions with, uh, with, um, with plexiglass. But we need to add this kind of vibroacoustic, um, we need to add this kind of resonant additions, and that can lead then to vibroacoustic favorable behavior. So um, less vibrations, less sound radiation, or uh, better transmission loss. And yeah, there are some rules how we have to add these, these resonant inclusions, but I did not go into details on that, on that. And then the main advantages that we see is that you have tunable frequency zones of attenuation, so you can steer them by design. You can make them both by conventional and con non-conventional um, materials or production processes. Um, and also you can make them enclosed. So here, these are examples where the structures are open because yeah, then at least you can see the resonant additions, but you can also um, enclose the resonators um, such you don't see them. And that's a nice thing because they're structural resonators and they're not acoustic resonators. And last but not least, um, they're also eligible for low cost manufacturing and integration. Um, so we think it's a nice solution, uh, which we will yeah, keep working on in the future and we hope to get it into more products. Um, so that's for the metal materials. Then a second result that I would like to bring is our activities with respect to bushing modeling and characterization. Um, so in general, you have a lot of flexible components, um, for example, in a vehicle, but in all kinds of mechatronic systems. And they can be there for different reasons. They can be there to interconnect bodies with different material properties. They can be there to compensate a bit for geometrical inaccuracies during um, assembly. But quite often, they're also added uh, for vibration reduction and, and energy dissipation. And then if you talk about vibration reduction and energy um, dissipation, you're quite often looking at um, rubber, um, reinforced rubber bushing um, as flexible components. Um, those are typically very favorable with respect to their yeah, set vibration behavior and energy dissipation behavior, um, especially if you look at the elastic uh, properties and the damping properties. But the issue is a bit with those components that they are highly nonlinear and that their behavior depends a bit on their pretension and the way that they are uh, manufactured. Um, so they're typically very difficult to incorporate in your models. Um, that's a bit an issue because if you look how megatronic systems are designed, um, they typically use this fee cycle where in the concept phase you try to use simple models and the more that your concept evolves, you go to more um, detailed model models. And then at the end, if you go back, you start validating first a component level, then a system level. And of course, um, we want in an early phase as accurate models as possible. And if you cannot have that, then at least uh, we want in this design cycle to be able to update our models such that we can do validation and if possible, um, steer settings of controllers or adapt our design. 
and that's a bit what we're working on um, for these bushings uh, for yeah have good models which can be used in early concept phase um, and have methods to do validation that if you have first prototypes that you can do um, updating of your models both your yeah um, detailed models as your concept models and to do this we have made a library called bushlab so it's a standalone library of different bushing models that can easily be interfaced with um, with standard um, commercial software. Um, typically for our research, we we um, we couple it to our multi-body research code. So that's a research code that we wrote ourselves for multi-body modeling. And the nice thing is if we combine those two, um, that equations are written in such a way that they can be used for um, parameter estimation and parameter updating. So if we make the models in Bushlab in MBRC, we can then use those models to do updating either on component level, which you see here. So this is a test of just a bushing. Or we can do it, for example, in quarter car setups, such that you can um, do characterization of the bushing, how it's installed, and with the real forces that it will um, undergo um, during operation. Um, so we can exploit those models both on, on component level as on system level. Um, and there, if you then go a bit deeper into the, the bush lab, um, models are what it does. So basically, you have the geometrical part. So we're able to have large or small translations and rotations of two interfaces or, or multiple interfaces of our component. And then between those interfaces, we have different kind of force models. So we have the standard state of the art force model for flexible components, such as elastic models, static um, hysteresis models, or dynamic models, or we have our own um, tailored models that we can add. And besides force models, um, we also um, already obtained the gradients of our parameters and our states for these models, such that it can be easily be exploited again, as mentioned in parameter updating. So there to give um, some examples. So the first one here is of a twist beam of a vehicle suspension. Um, so here we installed the twist beam to a large um, six degree of freedom shaker, and then we can do a characterization. So if you look in black, we have here on the left side experimental data of uh, slow moving, so quasi-static um, displacement. And then we can compare different kind of models uh, with respect to a force displacement behavior. And then you see yeah, what the error is in terms of Newton. And then you see here that um, the modified um, book one model that we use is, is indicated in green and it has the least error. And if you then look at this, this modified model um, that you tailored in-house, how it behaves dynamically for higher frequencies up to 20 Hertz, you see the experimental lines in full lines and the uh, and uh, um, the modeled lines in dotted lines. Then you see that it matches quite well if you look at dynamic stiffness and amplitude. And that with respect to phase to amplitude, we have some mismatch um, here at lower amplitudes, but overall that it matches quite well. So here we can do this kind of parameter updating based on our experiments to have a nice fit um, between models and experiments. Um, so this is the first um, this is the first example. Um, a second example is for a quarter car setup. So here we have the tire as well as um, the suspension. And then we're here looking at the top strut bushing. And you see the same thing. If you look at state of the art models, then you see that our uh, modified book run model behaves quite well um, quasi statically. So the error is relatively low um, compared to other standard models. And then if you look at the dynamic performance of the model, it also matches um, quite well. Um, so this to show a bit um, uh, what we're able of with respect to bushing modeling. Um, so we have a standalone library, which can easily be interfaced with other simulation environment, and it can be used for components and system level um, simulations and for identification. So that was a bit uh, what I wanted to, to bring across today. And then as a last thing, um, so if you want to reach out, um, yeah, here are my contact details. I was Klaus Kleis. And also with like to advertise a bit the conference that is coming up next year in September on noise and vibration in Leuven. So if you'd like uh, to come to Europe, you're always welcome um, to bring us a visit. So thank you for your attention. I think we have now some time for questions. Thank you.